Thank you for our presentation. Uh, first of all, we would like to uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. We would like to thank you, Benedict Savoy, Charlotte Guichard, and Christine Alval for giving us the opportunity to present our database. So you're going to discover it. <laughs> so. Uh, in the 1920s, the entry of pre-Columbian art on the market in France answers several bilateral needs, diplomatic, artistic, between France and Latin America. Since the end of the 19th century, the Hexagon and the countries of Latin America rediscovered themselves thanks to their con concomitant needs. In other words, their Economic and, economic and cultural exchanges coincided and translated their common will of recognition of their international scene. During this period, France loses gradually its cultural hegemony in Europe, and, um, and so it seeks new allies on the other side of the Atlantic. For these reasons, the French government engages a cultural policy in Latin America, particularly in Mexico, in Peru, in Argentina, and in Brazil. The purpose of this propaganda is to encourage the French have to connect with these selected countries through trade, travel, and sciences. These countries selected, but also to highlight the Latin American culture through exhibitions of pre-Columbian heritage in France. This diplomatic dash goes hand in hand with the development of anthropology and particularly that of the Americanism, whose preludes were set up at the Congress of the Americanists in 1875 in Paris. The increase of their interest in the Latin American cultures, as well as the recent archaeological discoveries, takes part of the progressive modification of the vision of the French and initiate a double revelation, aesthetic and ethical. For their part, the countries of Latin America are established gradually in independent nations ready to assume their pre-Columbian past. Conscious of the French needs, these nations, particularly Mexico and Peru, benefit from it to engage a vast program of seduction towards France in which the indigenism is the keystone, the keystone. Movement of idea to both political and social, but solitary and uh, artistic expressions closely related to nationalism by uh, its search of, uh, for American roots, its exaltation of the indigenous indigenous culture, this dash of indigenism, which its paroxysm between the years of 1920 and 1970. The indigenism, transnational and multipolar dynamics, takes part to generate a taste for America in Europe, in particular during the World Fair in Paris in 1878 with the exhibition of the House of Peru yeah, I made it. Um, <laughs> with the presentation, so this is, is in uh, 1868, um, uh, and with the presentation of Teocali. Teocali is a Mexican pyramid here at the uh, exhibition in 1989. Uh, During this event, the Peruvian and Mexican government presented openly in their respective houses pre-Columbian arts like a new instrument of national and uh, international seduction. In this context, at the end of the 19th century, the first steps of the market of the pre-Columbian arts were set up, especially Eugène Bobon. Well, I'm not going to develop about him because Manuel Chaffee already explained that he sold pre-Columbian arts. So, so um, I'm going to explain more uh, Joseph Brumer, um, even though <laughs> you spoke, but uh, Joseph Brumer is a pre-Columbian art. So at the beginning of the 20, no, this is another one. Yeah. At the beginning of the 20th century, Joseph Brumer, a sculptor and an active Hungarian gallery owner around the movement of primitivism, discovered African arts on his arrival, arrival in Paris in 1906. 
Uh, yeah, thanks to his close relationship with the poet Guillaume Apollinaire, the merchant Paul Guillaume, and the historian Karl Einstein, he opened an exotic shop of art in 1908 in Paris and sold African and Peruvian arts until his departure to the United States in 1914. This Hungarian sculptor represents one of the first mission of pre-Columbian arts in Paris and his dash undoubtedly influenced the blossoming of specialists in this geographical area, such as the merchant André Portier, Charles Raton, and a lot of them. So consequently, this study has an ambition to use the database carried, o carried out on the market of art to reveal the place of pre-Columbian arts on the artistic and commercial scene in France, and also to analyze the impact of the Latin American situation on the reception of this art in France. So before going into details, let me present you brief briefly uh, our data set, our baby. We first starting by collecting all the Parisian auction catalogs whose title contains the words pre-Columbian, primitive, America, Africa, or Oceania. At this time, these auction, auction sales of Asian artifacts were separated from the pre-Columbian and primitive ones, but the objects from Asia amounted in our data set to 23% of the total items. So in the end, we gathered up 50 auction catalogs and we transcribed them extensively into an Excel spreadsheet. We also mentioned when the, the artwork was reproduced in the catalog. So the data set contains 40,823 items. Then we matched the auction catalog with the Procès Verbal of the Serre created at the Archive de Paris. The Procès Verbal is a legal document written by a clerk during the auction sale. We managed to find 44 Procès Verbaux out of 50 because some auctioneers didn't give their archives to the Archive de Paris. Of course, the Procès Verbal is handwritten, most of the time very badly, as the auction goes very fast. <laughs> Here's the list of the sellers with their address and an uh, identifying number. You find it at the beginning of the Procès Verbal. So here we go. At the very left, you find the identifying number of the seller. Then you can read the auction order and the number of the item in the auction catalog. Here, the sale begins with the item number 256. Thanks to the catalog number, we thus matched uh, the description of the, of the artifact with its hammer price, the name of the purchaser, and his or her address. The hammer price is net of the buyer fee, which fluctuates be between 14 and 19.5% of the hammer price. The procès verbal also mentions when the seller removes the object. The output is a huge Excel spreadsheet, so let's analyze the results out of it. All the Parisian auction sales for pre-Columbian and primitive artifacts took place at the Hotel Drouot, rooms 8, 9, and 10. Here's the network of the auctioneers and the experts of these sales. The expert André Portier at the center dominates this section of the market. He was the son of Henri Portier, who started importing silk from China to Paris in 1875. Henri Portier started being an expert from, for Asian auction sales at the Hotel Drouot in 1909, and he, he imposed himself as the main expert for pre-Columbian and primitive artifacts in the interwar period, in collaboration, as you may see, with the auctioneer Léon Flagel for most of the sales. The latter was the son of a clockmaker, and he started being an auctioneer in 1909, and he managed to turn his customer base from judicial sales to voluntary auctions from artifacts from abroad. This map summarizes the volume of the artifacts and their average hammer price depending on the continent of origin, between 1922 and 1939. As you may see with the sticks, most of the items come from Africa, actually four artifacts out of 10. Then 25% of the objects sold at auction come from, uh, fr come from Oceania and Asia. 
Now let's look at the circles representing the average AMA price, which I computed in constant 1928 francs. The scarcity effect plays a great part in Oceania, since the average AMA price is relatively high, with 490 constant francs. Conversely, the value for African artifacts is lower uh, as they are more numerous. Interestingly, this map shows an economic puzzle for America because this continent is the most present at auction and shows the highest average price, which was 583 constant francs. And uh, according to the INSEE, National Institute of Statistics and Economic Studies, the average hammer price would equate to 35,758 euros nowadays. By looking chronologically at the number of items, we see that the American artifacts in red appeared quite late at auction in 1925, three years after the African statuettes. The bulk of the American objects came to the auction house between 1927 and 1930, whereas the 30s witnessed relatively more Asian artifacts. The increase of American artifacts in the late 20s corresponded to a rise in the average AMA price, and the prices from Asia and Oceania underwent the same changes, even deeper for Oceania. At first sight, this evolution may be, of course, correlated with the economic crisis of 1929. Maybe the sub-market of American and Oceanian artifacts was a speculative bubble bursting at the same time as the financial market. After a slowdown, the average price of American artifacts went up again in 1936 and 1937. Uh, now, if we summarize this information by considering only the pre-Columbian artifacts, we find again two stages. First, a sharp increase of both artifacts and prices. Then, a slowdown after 1932, with, nevertheless, an increase in prices only in 1936 and 1937. This first stage may be defined as the El Dorado, or the craze for the pre-Columbian artifacts. It is correlated with the economic and financial, financial sphere, of course, but also with the political and cultural context. <laughs> Thank you. So now I explain the political and cultural context. So the market of the pre-Columbian arts in Paris, particularly in the Duo Hotel, form part of the rise of the market of art no as primitive, starting from 1925. If some parts are put on sale at the beginning of the 1920s, the frequency remained too sporadic to be notable. Indeed, also the merchant Henri Canvailer sells in Paris object knows as Negro in 1921, and that the poet Paul Eloua sells a Peruvian ceramic in July in 1924, is only in 1925 that the the sale of primitive art is announced and become a specific commercial category in Hotel de Rouault. Moreover, the new statute of this art as work of art in Western perceptions confers necessarily a commercial values of the object. The first notable waves of interest for pre-Columbian art extend from 1925-26 to 1931. This period puts forward a decreasing interest for African arts and growing attraction for pre-Columbian arts. And by the end of the 1920s begins the interest for the oceanic arts. This chronological choice is also justified by the years 1928, yeah. since, as we can see here, the interest for the pre-Columbian arts culminate in Paris thanks to the passion caused by the exhibition on old arts of America organized uh, in the Museum of Louvre, more precisely in the house of um, Marsan. 
This event feeds the French market. Um, ten sales of pre-Columbian arts are organized in Paris in 1928, so it's a lot, and encourages the Latin Americans in their indigenous uh, policy in France. During this period, the interest in pre-Columbian arts in France is transformed into a true artistic, commercial, and more generally cultural fashion. This phenomenon takes its source in the aesthetic innovation brought by these arts and in the aspect, already out of date, of African art to the eyes of French. Moreover, Europeans prefer the pre-Columbian, oh yeah, thank you. Uh, European prefer the pre-Columbian art because they consider it as more pure as, and as a virgin ob object as free from contact with the old world. So this is, as you can see, is a Mexican space in the exhibition in 1928. So it was a game, but I tried to find all this um, work of art. This is still Anyway, this patient decreases temporarily in 1931 with the renewal for African arts brought by the exhibition of colonial arts in Paris and also because the incipient patient of for the oceanic art. So now Lea is going to explain the network. Very briefly, because as you may see when you when you analyze the, the net market, you draw a network. But here there are so many actors and uh, purchasers and sellers that uh, you don't see anything. So that's why we decided to uh, to split the analysis between purchasers and sellers. So I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So here's the, the hierarchy of the main sellers of uh, pre-Columbian artifacts between 1925 and uh, 1931. Yeah, well, of course, I'm not going to explain all. It will be interesting, but so long. So the network of the salesmen and the purchasers show an internationalization of the Parisian market, of course, and especially is central place for the trade of pre-Columbian arts. Thus, for example, we have Edmond and Flynn, first, is a collector of Copenhague, which already organized in 1923 uh, a small exhibition of ancient American art to the Royal Museum of Art and History of Brussels. And he sold in Paris an important part of his found in 1928 and 1929. So in almost one year, he sold over 400 works from Peru. And uh, another example is Bela Hain, as you can see in four, um, the Slovak merchant of art who lived in Paris, also sold 200 pre-Columbian objects in 1927. For example, it's interesting to know that they worked each other, Bela Hain, uh, worked with the Ernest Brumer, the brother of Joseph Brumer, the art, the art critic Adolf Baller, and the collector Walter Blondy. Bondy. And the last example is Edouard Gaffron, ophthalmologist of Lipstadt, and became an antique dial dialer, dealer specialized in the Peruvian production. And his collection was accessible to the public in Lima, but he had to transport them to resell them in Paris in 1930. So the trade of pre-Columbian arts is, as we can see on the map, there is a map. There, no. Yes. This is, it doesn't work. Yes. And uh, this is a triangular trade, which is articulated mainly between Latin America, North of Europe, and France. So here we have the, the list of the uh, purchasers. Uh, so as, as you may see, Portier and Raton were uh, antique dealers that uh, dominate the, the market in this period. And, uh, and uh, the market is overwhelmed with their purchases. So I, I don't have time to go very much into the, the details. But so here you see the, the Museum Sermiuski, uh, who's, who was uh, which was specialized in the uh, Asian artifact. And interestingly, uh, the museum buys not uh, Asian artifacts, but pre-Columbian ones for a total of uh, 579 constant francs. So the craze of, uh, of for pre-Columbian artifacts may also be seen in the top hammer prices because most of the peak prices were rich during this period. 
So once again, I don't have time, but let me comment briefly on this, uh, this vase. So the ham highest ha hammer price per provenance was reached by this vase from Colombia during the auction sale that broke all the records on the 30th of June 1927. The amount would equate now nearly 2 million and 400,000 euros. Not surprisingly, André Portier was the purchaser. Then comes uh, the statuette in Jadid from Mexico. Then uh, André Portier, again him, he paid the highest hammer price for a Venezuelan artifact. Uh, he, he also purchased this Peruvian, Peruvian vase. This uh, fetish from Haiti, from uh, the expert and art critic uh, Arthur Bloch, and this ball from uh, Costa Rica, sold by Desiree Pector, who was consul in Nicaragua. So the top hammer, higher price from, uh, for Nicaragua was reached in the same auction cell with uh, 25 heads of fetishes bought uh, by the antique dealer Vignier. Two years later, this anthropomorphic vase from Chile was purchased by another antique dealer, Asher, for 319 constant francs. And finally, the poet Paul Eluard paid the highest price for an artifact from Guyana. And not surprisingly, it was a bird. Now, let's analyze not the top prices, but the average prices uh, during the period of the craze for pre-Columbian artifacts. So the preferences, I'm going to explain very quickly because we ha don't have time, but the preferences is uh, for um, Peruvian and Mexican art, especially Andean art and, Mesor and art from Mesoamerica. Um, for example, uh, in the Andean uh, area, uh, European preferred uh, civilization of Nazca, Moshica, and Chimu. Here we have an example here too. And this is after. So this is, we find a lot of this piece in the, in the database. And for the uh, Mexican area, Mesoamerica, we found a lot of piece of a Aztec, Olmec, and Toltec. Here, no, this is not. So this is this, um, just quickly, th these preferences became known because of many works of explorer and scientists which affected directly the omnipresence of this area in the French collection, in, particularly, uh, in particular that of the Museum of Ethnography of Trocadero. So now I'm going to present you briefly the second period. The craze for pre-Columbian artifacts began to falter between uh, 1929. From 1932 uh, on, both the number of these objects and the prices underwent a slowdown. In 1935, no pre-Columbian artifact <coughs> was sold at auction. Then the average price went up again, but it lasted two years. Obviously, this slowdown corresponds to the economic depression that happened in France in the 30s, but the second peak may be explained by another particular <laughs> event. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, the second period is more a cultural period wave than commercial one, but feeds largely from the first wave. Indeed, the Latin Americans in Paris contributed to feed the market, but also to open it towards uh, new countries like Colombia, Costa Rica, and other countries of Central America. Moreover, if the pre-Columbian batches of art put on sale during this period do not increase, their cultural impact in France increased notably, in particular, in particular with the vast plan of propaganda car carried out by the Peru for the international exhibition of art and technique applied to the modern life in Paris in 1937. So the House of Peru and pre-Columbian exposed works caused an open passion among French, but this attraction was a short time because two conflicts the Second World War uh, that will notify considerably the relation and interest between France and Latin America. So here you may see the, the central hall of the House of Peru and another photograph oh, yeah. of the interior. Now it's uh, less beautiful, I'm sorry. So the, the slowdown of the number of, of pre-Columbian artifacts sold at auction 
may be explained also by the identity of the sellers. As a matter of fact, we can observe a shift in their nationalities. Germany stopped being a central hub towards Paris, cutting off the huge supply of pre-Columbian artifacts. From 1932 on, the main sellers came from South and Central America, like Chardin Obaika, the Mexican Augusto Vallejo Leal, uh, or the Cuban political Cosme de la Torriente y Peraza, who was appointed president of the League of Nations in 1923 and 1924. Looking at the purchasers, Portier and Raton stopped dominating the market and they were supplanted by the French painter Pierre-Louis Verité and the antique dealer Asher. Nevertheless, the total number of purchases never exceeded 30 items per buyer and the emulation in the auction room seems to have waned, like the emulation in hammer prices. Um, as a matter of fact, the 30s only witnessed two top hammer prices for Guatemala and Bolivia, never exceeding 1,500 constant francs. So, uh, Briefly, this isn't interesting because the test, uh, the, the European test changed during this period. Uh, the preferences go toward Mexico, Central America. Uh, here we can see the difference between two periods. And for example, we have uh, an example of um, pre-Columbian, uh, uh, an example of taste of for Mexico, but um, for uh, Mixtec two. This is, this is it's very famous, they loved it so much. And, um, and there is a taste for the Costa Rica too, and for the South America, the taste is, um, so the Central America and the South America is more in the Guatemala, and this is, and for uh, Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. So this period shows a new interest in these countries, except for Me Peru and Mexico, so it was the same, and created a new taste for pre-Columbian and for Colombian and Costa Rican production until no little known. So uh, in, as a conclusion, the interwar period witnessed a craze for pre-Columbian artifacts in the late 20s, which was explained both by the speculation and by the cultural and political context. Nevertheless, in the early 30s, Central and South America ceased to function as an Eldorado, and in, uh, the actors of the, the market turned their eyes towards new horizons. This graph shows the purchases by the main surrealists. In the early 20s, they focused on Africa. Then, in 1927, 1928, they joined the fashion for pre-Columbian artifacts, the pre-Columbian El Dorado, here in red. But in the early 30s, they shifted again to Oceania and North America. They stopped purchasing at the Hotel Drouot in 1933. From this moment on, and interestingly, the most val valuable artworks were, uh, were ancient Khmer and Sham sculptures, like this one, which was purchased uh, 5,100 uh, francs. But this is another story of another beauty of the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm.